You've reached Monster 911, and I'm Lance Hightower. I've been taking cryptid emergency calls for over five years. If you have a cryptid emergency, please call our toll-free number, 866-306-8085. I can help you. What's your emergency? Yeah, I've listened to your shows a few times, and uh, I just... I've had experiences all my life and, you know, really and truly a lot of times you just have to sit back and put two and two together and say, well, damn, you know, that's what that was, you know? Yeah. Um, mm. And that's kind of what we talk about. Uh, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people over the years and one of the things that they talk about a lot is that when they finally have an encounter or something plays peekaboo around a tree, all those previous things over the years or months all of a sudden come rushing back and they go, Oh, that's what yeah, that you, was. Yeah. You're starting to connect the dots. <laughs> that's you know? exactly what we say. Connect the dots. And because the mind doesn't want to, you know, we, we want to rationalize everything. We don't want to think it's one of these creatures. We don't want to think it's a, this or that we, we try to go, well, Oh, it's this, you know, Oh, well, big deal. You know, and you let it go. Well, the problem with, with, society today is that it's almost you know like everybody's living in this bubble and the things that that would be evident you know self-evident to people people just kind of like it doesn't fit into their narrative of their lives so they brush it off and you know a lot of people talk about well if you start talking about experiences with them that you know they laugh at you yeah, you know, and I've had that. I've had I've had people not laugh, but kind of, you know, they kind of look at you, mm -hmm. kind of cut their eyes at you, like you know the woo factor, you know. Well, they give you that look. <clears throat> yeah. They give you that yeah. look, like, are you serious? You know, yeah, you must. Exactly. You're you're one of those people, and what else do you believe in? You know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, we've gotten that look many times by family, by friends, and they make they yeah. they make fun of that, but. Exactly. You know, we know what we know, and uh, we've seen what we've seen, and we've heard what we've heard, and you can't take that well, away from anybody. And um, well, so that's kind of what we, you know, we we dealt with, and that's kind of why we started the show. Some, you know, back in 2017, is we really kind of did it as therapy, self therapy. But we realized that there was a lot more people that was um, behind the scenes that were ridiculed or embarrassed, and. You know, we wanted to, you know, give a platform that they didn't feel that way because we had our own yeah. experiences. And, um, you know, that's kind of the premise behind the show, mm -hmm. really, and that we could help exactly. them cope a little bit because we've, we've had some very strange experiences we can't explain any other way. Exactly. And <clears throat> with me, you know, I'm an Iraq war veteran. God uh, bless you. I, God bless you. Well, thank you. Uh, I've experienced things over there that would kind of make you go, whoa, what, what was that? You know, they talk about the gin over there and things like that, you know, and, and that, that's pretty wild over there. Some of the, you see ghosts over there. I mean, literally ghosts. Well, maybe we can you know? tap into that a little bit here during our talk, just a little bit, because I've heard that, but no one's really spoken specifics about that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of like, Okay, I was born in Chicago. I lived in Chicago and, and out the outlying suburbs of Chicago till I was probably about eight or nine years old. Okay. And my first experience, which was a UFO experience, I was just a little, I mean, I was probably seven, six or seven years old. Now, in Chicago, you have different neighborhoods like Chinatown and uh, Jewtown, a tight little Italian town, you know. Mm -hmm. places like that which are neighborhood and i remember we went to jewtown one summer i think it was in june and they were having their festival oh my the food is so spectacular that's one of the things i miss the most about chicago was the food mm. but i remember being a child holding my dad's hand and you know the, the neighborhood was all lit up but i for some reason i looked up straight up above the skyline and I saw the silhouette of a black object, you know, in the dark sky. And then underneath it was light spinning, you know, your, your typical UFO flying saucer, you know. And that was the first time that, you know, I, I can recall experiencing anything, you know, 
what do you want to call it, uh, high strangeness, I guess. And you saw it spinning. Yeah, it was like like little lights in the bottom of it rotate. The bottom was rotating, the top was stationary. And it was just moving real slowly across the skyline. Hmm. See, I, I remember seeing that. I saw when no, I, I saw don't... mine when I was ten. I saw rotation as well. I I well, it was really strange. We'll get into something here in a little bit that actually blew my mind just later on in life. Sure. But have you ever heard of Wisconsin Dells? Yes. Okay, now, when I was young, <clears throat> all of my aunts and uncles, my mom and dad, we'd all get together and go somewhere like Wisconsin Dells and go camping for like a three or four day weekend. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was my first Bigfoot encounter. <clears throat> because me and my cousin, my cousin was about the same age as me. Okay. And we got our campsite set up, the tents and everything set up, the campfire and everything. I mean, you know, I mean we're just little... You know, pre not even nine, ten years old, and we kind of wandered off. We were all in, you know, going out in the woods and you know all that little you know what boys do. Sure. And we wandered down a trail, probably, probably about a quarter of a mile down the trail, and it was just growing up, nobody around, nothing. We kind of just wandered off. Okay. Well, then we turned around, and we came back. And later on that night, you know, it got dark and everything. And me and my cousin was sitting by the campfire. And we started hearing what we thought was horse hooves. Because, you know, the, the campsites had the little pave tra pavement going around. And then it ball knobs and comes back. Oh, yeah. Well, we're sitting there and we're like, oh, wow, is that a forest ranger on a on a horse coming through, you know, it's probably about 11, 12 o'clock at night. I would think mm -hmm. it, was, it was dark, been dark. And we're hearing that clicking sound and we're waiting for, you know, the, maybe somebody to ride by on a horse in front of our campsite. But we are probably about 20, 25 feet away from that paved road. Right. And we're sitting there at the campfire and we're looking and we're, we're hearing it, we're hearing it, and it's like we're steadily hearing it, but it's not, it's not, you know, coming in view. And then all of a sudden we see the silhouette of something huge. And I look at my cousin, and he looks at me, and we just kind of look at each other with our mouths dropped wide open. And we're thinking, of course, as kids, it's the headless horseman. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. because we sit, we see this silhouette of something huge, mm -hmm. and it had no head. And I just got to thinking about it. Here, you know, as an adult, and think that's what they call no heads. Mm. The, Sas the Sasquatch with no head, mm. because their heads are so pronounced in front of them it looks like they got shoulders and no head i see and oh my god we run me and my cousin it scared us so bad we never actually laid eyes on it but here's the thing we saw the silhouette of it because in the darkness it was darker than dark hmm. and we're sitting there we're sitting there looking and of course it's it's like something huge but it has no head and we're steadily hearing the clicking you know right and we just ran we ran back into the tents and i guess i, I you know we were young then so that, that's that's the most i can remember of it so we ran back towards the tents and got in the tents and got in the sleeping bags and just covered our heads up you know so what but, do you think the clicking was do you think that was the their gnashing of the teeth or something I don't know. I mean, it was it was a crisp click. Like I said, it sounded like horse hooves, uh, horseshoes, on the pavement. Okay. That sharp, you know that sharp tone. Yes. But it wasn't real loud. But it didn't get you know it didn't like it hmm. sound like it got closer or further away. It sounded like it was stationary. Okay. And that's one of the things that you know me and my cousin was like, well, if if it's a horse. Why isn't it getting further away or getting closer? You know, a horse isn't going to walk in place. Right. 
So we're sitting there going, and then when we saw that silhouette, it like any kind of light there was, it just kind of sucked it up. And it was just darker than dark, you know? Right. And, you know, it took me a long time to realize what we saw, to realize what it was. Because, I mean, even as a young adult, I'm 53 now, but even as a young adult, I would think back on that. I'm like, horse, headless horseman, what is that all about, you know? What does your cousin think about that moment? Well, he's one of those that, he conveniently doesn't remember. Oh. Or he just, or that, that's just what he says to not talk about it. Right. Right. You know, that, that's what a lot of people do. I, I don't remember that. What are you talking about? Mm. You know? And so that, that was that, that was my first experience with, with something, I guess, high strangeness as far as Bigfoot's concerned. I don't like to call them Bigfoot because, it, to me, that trivializes them, and and that's how people take the uh, sincerity out of it, you know, kind of like they yeah. call them Bigfoot, and, and then, then it's a joke. Yeah, you that's know? almost kind of how I view this dog man creature. I, I don't like the name. Um, like Bigfoot, I would rather call it more Sasquatch. Um, yeah. it has more of a true, I don't know, more of a primitive sound to it. Um, and then dog man, mm. really, I don't know who coined that term, but you know, it has canine features, obviously, or wolf like features. Um, but there's also features of it or characteristics behaviors. I should say there, there is anatomical features closely resembling a man or a human. Uh, with digits, some people say, you know, there's digits. Wiley Dave saw digits on his um, in western Oklahoma. But there's also intellectual characteristics that really mystify people and yes. frighten them terribly just because well, canines typically don't behave that way. And so I think that combined really gave this name that now is quite common, the dog man. Well... <clears throat> My first experience with a dog man was almost my last. Oh. I really believe it was. See, we moved to Arkansas. I live, lived in Mississippi County, Arkansas, the Blyville, Manila, Osceola area pretty much all my life. I moved up towards Mountain Home area probably 2015. Okay. So I, <clears throat> and I grew up here in the Blyville, Mississippi County area. And we used to go hunting at a place called Big Lake. We called it Big Lake Bottoms. Okay. And, okay, it was like you had to cross this, I guess the ditch is probably, I mean, the ditch runs for miles. And you had to cross a bridge uh, to that ditch that they called the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers built it. Hmm. And there was there's pumping stations to control the water level in the ditches and stuff. I hunted. Uh, my grandpa, my dad, my grandpa used to take me hunting. You know, when I was a kid, and then when I turned 16 and could get, get my own driver's license and go hunting, mm -hmm. I went. I would. There, it was nothing for me to take a day off work to go hunting. Oh know? right. And uh, if you know about deer, when the deer woods are full of hunters, the deer are in the thickets. They're out of the woods, mm -hmm. the, the big bucks. Right. They're hiding in the thickets. Well, I went to this thickets, and I was really just squirrel hunting. I always wore my hunting vest, which I carried four, I think it was two and three quarters or, or three inch slugs. The heaviest load slugs I could find, I always carried with me. Okay. So I always said, I, always said I, I don't know what I might run into, but I'll have them. <laughs> right. You good know. to have good to have but in, anyways i went in went to this thickets and i, I i'm basically squirrel or rabbit hunting you know mm -hmm. i think bow season was open but gun season wasn't and uh so i i, I walked up to this thickets and I've, I've hunted these thickets since i was you know could hold a gun really 
with my dad and my grandfather. Right. I started going by myself. I had a 12 gauge and, you know, 16 year old boy with a 12 gauge, you know, he pretty feel pretty much feels invincible. <laughs> right. You know, so I walk into this thickets same way. I always go in, you know, same way I've always went in, you know, mm -hmm. and I walked in probably about 15 or 20 feet. And something caught my attention, and the, what caught my attention was it was dead. There was not a bird, squirrel, nothing making any kind of sound. You know, not even crickets or locusts or anything like that. It was just dead. Hmm. And what I would do is I would scan from my left to my right. Okay. Just kind of get a bearing of, of you know, my area that I just, you know, that I'm, I'm – so I scan from my left, start at my left, and I'm just going to my right. And I just keep scanning, and then I stop. And I realized I saw something. And it kind of, one of those, what the, you know, excuse my language, but it was like, what the hell was that? Mm -hmm. And so I turn, and I, I, I go the exact opposite, the same momentum that I'm scanning, and I stop. And about that time, there he is. He's standing next to a tree. And instantaneously, you know, I have my, my 12 gauge in a ready position mm -hmm. to point the aim to point and aim. Okay. But I have it in a relaxed position to lift it up to my shoulder. Okay. So I come back and I'm scanning back now. Boom, there it is. And like a flash it like uses the tree that it's standing next to, to, to shoot itself off and it shoots itself off. It's probably, probably about 45 feet, maybe 30 feet away from me. It's really close. Oh, wow. When you say shoots off, you mean pushing off the tree? Yes. It's like trying to use the tree to, to push with extra momentum. Yes. And as it does that, I see it. And it's almost, it's cartoonish fast. I don't know if anybody's ever explained it. It's like how quick they move in a cartoon, you know? Mm-hmm. And here it comes at me, and I'm barely up. I'm raising, I don't know what the hell I got coming at me. So I raised my, because I saw, what I did is I saw a silhouette of a head with ears like a dog. Okay. Only thing is, it didn't look like a wolf. It didn't look like a German shepherd to be honest with you it had more of a pit bull head oh okay kind of like a pit bull and it's coming at me now I mean I'm 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 raising my 12 gauge up because I'm like well all I got squirrel shot in my gun I'm not gonna do nothing but piss it off mm -hmm. but as it comes at me and I raise my gun up I'm not even aiming you know Went my eye and aimed at it. I just raise it up because I'm like, by the time I pull his trigger, he's gonna be on me. Oh wow! And and so as as I get the gun up to shoulder level and leveled off, he does like a veer, almost like a U. And instead of coming at me, he starts veering off in a U away from me. Hmm. And then and then as I as he gets okay, to the edge of the thickets, because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just, just stepped into the thickets there in like a corner of it, and he gets to the edge to it. He stops, and he just stops instantaneously and looks at me. And he doesn't look at me like he, he wants to eat me. He doesn't look at me like he's disgusted with me. He looked at me like, yeah, you're lucky this time. You're real lucky. And then he takes off. Hmm. Now, how close was sitting there? How close was he when he stopped? Well, he 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 got probably within probably about eight feet of me when he he made like a U. Oh wow! I think what he done is he realized that I had a boomstick, mm -hmm. and when I got it to where he can actually tell that I've got it, right? That's when he started veering off. Because about the time I got it shoulder level, 
is when he veered and did just almost like a U. Hmm. You know, almost just like a curve. And he just looked at me like, you're really, really lucky. Well, when this happened, I was probably between 16, 19 years old, somewhere between there's something young teenage. And it, it messed me up and I kind of went home. This was probably about, I don't know, probably about eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Wow. And when you say, it me, did it ever, did it ever, was it on two legs, four legs? Oh, it was on two legs. Two legs. It was on two legs. Oh, wow. He come, now, when he was running at me, he may, have, he may have got down on four. I don't know. Cause like I said, he used that tree to kind of shoot himself at me. Okay. Because when I went home and I sat there and I thought about it, I, I sat there and yeah, I'm, I'm shaking up and stuff. And, and it, be honest with you, I wasn't, I was startled. I was basically trying to figure out what that was. Mm -hmm. And that, that curiosity got me because I ended up, instead of having four slugs in my vest, I brought two boxes of slugs with me and I went back later on that evening and I'm trying to the place where this happened at, where he was actually standing at, because to be honest with you, I was starting to wonder if it actually happened. Hmm. Kind but of I went surreal. back. I went back and I went to the tree I first saw him at. Right. And there's four claw marks where he used his claws to push himself towards me. Hmm. That now, told me that that happened. I had, mm, shouldn't be right. questioning that it happened because it happened. So when you say f there was four, is that what you said? Yes, four <laughs> claw marks. Just like he had his, I guess he had fingers. Okay. And and pushed just like just like you're swimming in the water and you're you're pushing, but you got your your hand next to something, you push yourself off it real fast. Right kind of get you that extra momentum mm -hmm. that, that that's what I experienced. So and this, it was by itself. Was, it was by itself as far as you're aware of. Well, I didn't go at that, that particular time when that happened, I collected myself the best I could. And I, I don't know if I shook and walked or walked and shook, but I, I went back to my car and, and, got in my car and left. I don't even think I unloaded my 12 gauge. I had a single shot 12 gauge. Okay. I don't even think I unloaded it. And it just had squirrel shot. If I would have hit him with squirrel shot, he'd probably be eating on me, you know. He would have done ate me up. So can you describe a little bit of the characteristics of it? I mean, you said it looked kind of like a pit bull, I believe you said? Okay. This happened back in, I would say, the late 80s to early 90s, somewhere around that area. There's a movie that came out way back then. I just watched it, matter of fact, uh, uh, last, I guess, last November. Okay. And it was, a, it was a movie called Fright Night. I remember hearing that. Okay, now, it's the original one that came out. I think they've had a remake of it, but the original one that came out. And if you watch it, and at the end of the movie, where they're at the vampire's house, and they're inside the basement trying to stake him, kill him, or whatever, mm -hmm. it turns into a bat, like a monstrous, huge, monstrous bat. Okay. And if you, if you watch that and look at that bat, the head on that bat, I say is almost identical to what I saw. It's the only thing that I can compare it to that I've that I've seen that I can compare it to because it 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 basically looked like a pit bull that was having a really bad day. You know. It was monstrous. The the head was monstrous. But like I said, it 
it, it more shocked me and startled me and scared. I mean, going back and thinking about it, especially mm-hmm. when I went back and saw the marks on the tree. Yeah, that I was scared then. Matter of fact, throughout all the experiences I've ha- I ha- I've had, I do live I live uh, in Arkansas, okay. and my backyard is core land all the way to the lake and all the way around. Mm. And there's all kinds of stuff that goes on out here. Oh yeah. But I just I I've got a balcony that I sit on, and I I've got my back porch gated up where you know. I'm off the ground and I, you know, I, I'm looking at, I don't ever, I haven't been hunting in years. Okay. You know, I don't know if that's part of it. I think it, it contributes to it about me not going to the, I'm not scared to go into the woods, mm-hmm. but I, I think between these experiences in Iraq, I just hunting just isn't, I, I can track, I can hunt, but I just don't have the, ambition to sure you know and i don't know if that's that that plays a part in it or not it does i guess it does to a certain extent i would say so but uh that was my first dog man encounter wow and that's pretty terrifying I, something coming at you like that well i didn't have a chance to be scared or terrified yeah it happened so quick yeah because what you know like i said i was scanning my area looking because I've always said, that when you go, you know, especially squirrel hunting, you know, if a squirrel hears you, you'll never see him. And if a squirrel sees you, you'll never even hear him. You know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, you, I'm always scanning in the forest looking for squirrels. And, of course, my father ta- taught me how to spot a bedded up rabbit you know just bedded up in the weed sitting there Mm -hmm. you know so this when this dog man came at you tell me about the size of this thing he was he wasn't huge he was probably he may have been six foot got the pit bull head okay the it looked like the reason why I compared compared the head to the the movie is because it wasn't like a normal pit bull, you know, with the fur, yeah, and stuff. It was almost skin toned, but it was as monstrous as what it was. And so it was it, definitely so large that you it was it was notably different. Yes, because. I, if he would have got on me, there's no way, you know, I'm, I was 230 pounds, you know, I, I was in real good shape. I was in the prime of my life. Okay. And, you know, I had 12 gauge shotgun in my hand and, you know, at, even at that time, uh, I was a, a, a pretty experienced hunter mm-hmm. and I know, I knew then just like I know now, if he would, if he would have got a jump on me, if he would have just if I wouldn't have seen him and he would have got a jump, there's no way I, I would have even been able to do anything. I'd just been lunch to him or breakfast. Well, that's what I was going to ask know. next. What if you would have had your back turned to it? There's no way. There, there, there's no way. And you know, most predators, they wait for that opportunity. And they that do. That been what he was doing. They, they, they do. I know uh, mountain lions attack from the back and they bite their, their prey right on the neck of that central nervous system and you can't escape. Yes. Yes, or they, a, a big cat will bite your, you know, take a bite out of your skull, you know. And oh yeah. Your skull. Yep. You know? But you know that's that's what scares you is because when you realize that this happened to you and if they would have been able hmm. to get get you, you know, get behind you, you would have never stood a chance. And as fast as he was, and that was on two feet, but of course, like I said, he like pushed himself off a tree. And right on top of me. And so you didn't you know, know what this was. I had no clue. Th- this is back in the 80s. I never even heard of a dog man. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I had two choices of what it could be. A monster or an alien. That In my mind, that was all there was. There was no, you know, never heard of a dog man. Sure. So it was either a monster or an alien. And I 
if it was either, it would have been both, you know? So a did, monstrous alien. Did you, um, so you told your family or you told someone when you got back to the house? Uh, let me think here. I told my, I think I told my girlfriend. Okay. And of course it was kind of like, yeah, okay. Okay. Well, you know, what's going on TV, you know, something like that, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, okay, that happened to you. Okay. And meantime, I'm watching all my children or something, you know? Right. And you're kind of like, well, okay. It's, I was just so, curious if you shared with a family member and then they have had experiences too, or anything like that. No. Uh, my dad was my, now my dad told he's a, he was a Vietnam veteran. He passed in 2017, I believe. And he used to tell stories about Bigfoot over in Vietnam. Hmm. He, I remember he, he would, he, and he didn't care if you believed him or not. He'd tell you, I'm going to tell you right now. We had a CO that went to his tent or went to the talk or something like that. And we heard a ruckus and we went in there and everything inside that command station was just absolutely destroyed, turned over and all that. And a big hole ripped in the back of it. And our, our, he's like, our commander was, was gone. He was, he was in pieces. He was in pieces. Yeah. He said that they found pieces of them all up behind with behind the tent where the, it was ripped open that, you know, you walk Dang. out, I think he said 15, 20 feet and he, you find an arm or a leg or something. Said so the thing just ripped them to pieces. What did, I mean, did someone see this occur or did they just have seen a creature like, and they said it must be that. Well, they heard it. Oh, they did. They, they heard everything, and it was inside the tent. And the CO just left their presence and went into the tent and, I guess, walked in on it. Oh, dang. And it just, for lack of better terms, went ape shit on them, tore them to pieces. You know, that that's what my dad would tell me about, you know, yeah. that happened in Vietnam. So he he didn't talk a whole lot about it. Right. But every now and then, you know, like something would come on about Bigfoot back then. And he would, you know, back when I was younger and he'd, he'd say, well, this is what happened. I know they're real over in Vietnam. I don't know about here, but in Vietnam, they, you know, this is what happened to RCO. Yeah, I've had a couple uh, interviews with uh Vietnam vets and they talk about they they call them rock apes exactly yeah and but they and, were big and they would be in the trees looking at them just throwing rocks and anything else but they were big they they looked very very humanistic they were much yes. bigger than any ape <laughs> and my dad told me when they saw them because at other times they would see them they would actually throw rocks at them <laughs> you know he said that they would move in almost a jerky motion you know, that they hmm. didn't move fluidly like we do, that they would move in a jerky motion. Interesting. You know? hmm. Hmm. So that that's what he told me. It, what did he compare it to? A mole or a weevil or something like that? Okay. That the way that they would move, you know, it's like if they rose their hand up, it, it, it would be like a shaking going up. And a shaking going down, or if they walked, it, it would be like a jerking motion. Hmm. You know, interesting. So that, that's what he told me. Okay. Okay. My second encounter. Okay. I told you, you know, there's big lake bottoms. It's basically a, it's not a reserve, but a, a animal preserve, preserve, I guess. Mm -hmm. Something to that. You could go hunting there. You only, they only gave so many tags to be hunted there. Okay. You know, and the deer in Mississippi County is so bad. I mean, I lived there almost all my life, and I, I can tell you I've seen deer there maybe maybe four times in my entire life. It's like they hunted the bottoms out, and I think at one time they were trying to reintroduce some more deer to the area. Okay. And they were bringing them in. But anyways, I was squirrel hunting. And I, I went probably about 
probably about a mile and a half, two miles back up in the woods. Okay. Down a trail. You know, they have hunting trails where you can just, you know, God, I think if if you look on the map, Big Lake Bottoms will start there around the Manila area. And I think I think they'll come out somewhere around the Kennett, Missouri area. So there's, there's a lot of miles of bottoms there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, <clears throat> I went in. And I was squirrel hunting, and like I said, I was, I, I was, what it was, I have a friend, I had a friend back then, that he had an aunt or a grandmother, and they, he would tell me to bring them all the squirrel and rabbit I can kill, because she'll take them and make tamales out of them. Oh. You know, and, you know, they, 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 were, they were good, you know. I'm sure. I've had them a few times. But they they, they kind of lived off stuff like that, making tamales out of them and stuff like that. Sounds good. And so I would go squirrel hunting, and I'd always kill, you know, my limit just about every time. Mm-hmm. But I went way back up, about a mile and a half. Well, it's not really that far back up in there. And I'm squirrel hunting, and I've got my, my slugs and my vest, you know. Right there on my shoulder, those four host, little holsters there for your slugs there. Yep. Right up on your shoulder. And, of course, I've got, like, that time I probably had three or four squirrel in my, you know, my pouch. And I get up to a tree. And it's probably about eight to ten inches round. And it's bent in a U, you know. Hmm. A complete U. And I'm kind of looking at them. I'm thinking to myself, that's neat. Of course, at that time, we didn't know what structures were. We didn't know about the, what they do and stuff. I didn't know about it. Right. Really didn't know nothing about them. And it's been in a U. And I'm sitting there. I find an old dead stump <clears throat> next to a tree. And I decide, well, I'm going to sit down and smoke a cigarette. And as I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette, a squirrel just comes out of nowhere. So I popped the squirrel, and I'm thinking to myself, and I've always had, my, my father is Cherokee Indian, and my great my grandfather was almost full-blooded Cherokee in, Indian. And they used to talk to me about sometimes you give back, you know. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, I thought to myself to say thank you, you know, for the game that I've gotten. I always try, every now and then I might leave one or two squirrel hanging in a tree. Okay. For anything that's hungry, you know. Sure. You know, kind of saying, well, you know, this is giving back to the, the, the bounty that I've got. So on that U there, that tree that's kind of bent over in a U, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'll just hang one up there. Sure. So now I've got I've got game in my, my pouch, on, you know, on my back there, that little right. thing in the back of your vest. Mm -hmm. And then I've got one hanging in that, and I'm sitting right across the trail from that, where that squirrel, I set that squirrel up because I thought I'd rest here and I'll start on my way back. Right. So I'm sitting there, and then just out of nowhere, from further back up the trail, going back up into the woods, two deer show up. And, I mean, they're looking at me. They're sweaty. They're hot. They look like their tongues are about to hang out. And... One of them just walks up right to me. I thought he was going to put his head in my lap. Wow. And he lays wow. down at my feet. And I'm sitting there looking at him. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, it's not gun season, but I've got those slugs. And I'm thinking, man, here's my chance. I can get a deer. Right. You know, and I, I sit there and I break, I got a single shot 12 gauge. I break that 12 gauge down nice, slow and quiet. And I pull that slug out of my vest and I, Popped that squirrel shot out, and I'm fixing to load it up. And I think, man, I got a mile and a half up, and then it's a parking lot, like a gravel parking lot there. Mm -hmm. I just know if I pop that you can tell when you somebody, you know, unloads a slug. Mm -hmm. You can tell by the sound of it. Right. I'm thinking to myself, well, I better not, man. I've got a mile and a half to walk to carry this thing. That's a lot of walking. And somebody would probably be sitting there waiting on me when I walk out with it. Mm -hmm. So I I put this slug back in my pouch and I start putting that squirrel shot back and I 
slowly clicked it up. And that deer, I mean, that deer, I, I could sit there and touch it. Wow. You know? and strange, then, strange behavior. And then it sounded like a bulldozer over my right shoulder back up. I mean, this is where it's really thick at. This is where the woods, like all types of thorn bushes and stuff. I mean, thick. But I wouldn't even attempt to try to go through it. Okay. And something something come running up. I mean, and it it sounded like somebody just had a bulldozer doing 30 mile an hour through those woods. And then all of a sudden, before I could see, because I'm sitting there wondering what's coming at me. Right. And the deer's not running. They're sitting there. One of them is standing there and looking at me like, what are you going to do? And the other one's kind of laying there like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, it just... They, they look like your pet animals, like like your dog or something, sit, sitting there waiting on you to do tricks for them. Mm-hmm. And that's how, what they look like sitting there. And that thing come running up, and it stopped right before it come busting out. And then I heard a, Hoop! and I was sat there, and I when that Hoop! happened, those deer, their heads popped up, the one laying down jumped up, and off they ran. And they're running back up towards the front where I parked at. Okay. Running that way on the trail. And I'm sitting there, and I just, you know, put the squirrel shot back into my gun. And I'm sitting there looking like, you know, I'm just like, if, you, if, if you're going to come out, come out. Mm-hmm. You know? And the only thing I could hear is it sounded like, and it, 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 to me, it was like it meant for me to hear it, to hear it breathing. It didn't growl. It just that deep, graspy breath. Mm-hmm. Like, like, uh, you know, and wow, I'm sitting there going, if you're going to come out, come out, you know, right. because I was kind of like, you know, you got me hands down. Whatever you are, I mean, it, it, it sounded like it was the size of a bulldozer or, or at least a VW a bug or something, you know. It was something, it sounded like something that you could not possibly get down in there, you know. The size of something like that you could not possibly get down in there. Was this close? So it, it was probably 20 feet away and then probably oh. an extra five feet of thickets, just so thick you couldn't see. It was like a wall. Okay. Every kind of poison ivy, poison oak, and thorns, and all that there. You mm-hmm. you could not see through it. But it's it's like it stopped right there. Matter of fact, when it stopped, right there, mm-hmm. I could see it move. I could see the 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 thickets moving. Okay. You know, and I knew something was right there. Right. And I'm thinking, there's no way that's a bug. There's no way that's a hog, you know? Right. And at that time, I didn't know what it was. It's one of those connect-the-dot moments because at that time, I didn't, you know, really wasn't no internet or nothing like that. It was just getting really off the ground, and you wasn't hearing right. a whole lot of it. And I was sitting there going, if you're going to come out, come out. Yeah, and it never did. Yeah, it was like... It it just said it just went dead. Okay. And and those wow. deer look like I mean they the deer probably weren't a hundred pounds a piece. I'd figure them probably about seventy to eighty pounds at the most. Hmm. Just little deer, but they came up to me like they were my pets. You know. It seems like and when like deer said, have strange behavior like that, I, I've I remember hearing accounts on some other kind of semi documentaries regarding hunters. And where deer have done that, where the deer have had to smell the hunter or, uh, and, and, or they'll just get right by the, the, the uh, tree stand or right at the uh-huh. feet of the hunter. And they're like, yep. what's going on? And then of course the deer is just sticky, sweaty. You could see that yeah. the hair is all matted and they're, the deer yep. really kind of foam at the mouth from running. Yep. Hmm. Bizarre, bizarre. And, and, you know, for me, that was like, you know, 
I, I just really, at that time, had no idea what it could have been. You know, and it, it was later connecting the dots and saying, what could that have been? You know, you know, we don't have bull moose or elephants or nothing like that. Right. And even a moose or an elephant would have had a hard time getting through that stuff. I mean, it was bad. It was thick. It was one of those things where you look at it and you're like, I don't think so. I don't think I'll even get near that stuff. Well, what you can yeah. say is that from a human being standpoint, we avoid stuff like that. I mean, you yes. look at that and you're like, I'm not running through that. I'm going to tear up my clothes and get my eye poked and have yep. thorns and cut. You look at that and you yep. go, I'm not doing that. You know, and so you, and then, you go around. Then you got to worry about the poison oak, poison ivy and all that. Oh, yeah. You know? Especially in the but, summertime. But, you know, you're talking about getting hung up in it. There's, you know, you get hung up in it. You're just you're just hung you know, mm -hmm. you get in there and if you get stretched out and hung up, you know, where you, you can't put your arms and legs together to get any kind of power to bust anything loose, you're just stuck there. Yeah. You know, I mean, I imagine you can eventually wall yourself out of it, but you're just stuck there. You know? Yeah. No, you're right. But, you're absolutely right. But it was one of those things where you really had to sit there and, and you know, you're trying to, trying to put just trying to realize what it was and of course you never really know what it was mm -hmm. but you know i think you got a good ideal i can't prove what it was you know and then um uh, i had another encounter in the tickets and there's thickets all along there's a place there outside of bible mm. and it's just just an old-time community you know a old houses and stuff matter of fact my grandparents lived out there oh wow you know, way back way back in the you know i think 60s and 70s okay you know i think even in the 80s they lived there and my granddaddy used to all you know when i was a kid used to always talk about the boogers are going to get you oh we did yeah mm. and i'm like the boogers i mean the booger man no the boogers so, because when, you know, like if they would babysit, babysit me, you know, it's like after dark, you did not go outside. They would lock the doors up and you didn't go outside. And they would talk about the boogers getting you. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that was the course. older, that was the, that was the older term around, um, I, I say the South, but at least in Oklahoma and it sounds like Arkansas and many places, I'm sure other States, but Oklahoma for sure. Before it was Bigfoot, they called them boogers. Yeah, I was just a real it's common. Cool. Now there may have there may have been other names like El Reno, Oklahoma. I guess they had a period where there was chickens being stolen by a Bigfoot, a Sasquatch, but they called it the uh, the Chicken Man or something around the yep. Chicken Ape, something around those lines. So I'm sure it went by different names depending on what it stole, what livestock, what animals, or whatever it was seen doing. Yeah. I'm sure that's what they gave it the name of. And the creativity of the person that witnessed it. Yes. So I'm, I'm sure, uh, who knows how many different names over, over you know, earlier yeah. periods, what, what they were called. Yep. We see there's another set of thickets that I went to, but they all run along that ditch. And then you cross that ditch, you know, it was probably about 60 foot wide. It probably wasn't no more than 8 to 12 foot deep at the most. Okay. But what they would do in duck season, they would use that water and they would flood the woods for duck hunting. Hmm. You know, and so we call it the bottoms because they would flood, you know, the, especially, you know, in late winter or or, or late fall, we get a lot of rain, mm -hmm. you know, and so they would flood that and they would duck hunt out there. Duck hunters would have a field day out there. Oh, I'm sure. So along that ditch there on this side of the ditch, you know, you would have, you know, I think they grew uh, cotton and soybeans was the, was the crops. And there would be spots, I guess <laughs> It could be old homestead spots where they just let it grow up around it, eventually fall down and just be another thicket of woods and stuff. Yeah, possibly. 
But I mean, there's all along that ditch. There's little, you know. I mean, they're not very big thickets at all. But I learned that's where if you want to kill a deer, especially during deer season, mm-hmm. hit those thickets. That's where the big bucks are at. Mm, right, right. So I went down this other gravel road off Half Moon, and it run along a ditch. It run back there toward the, towards those ditches. Okay. Or towards that big ditch. And it's probably about probably about three miles back. You take a gravel road and it runs along the side of a small ditch. And then it dead ends at this little old time wooden bridge across another little ditch, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you never that's where the gravel ended, right there's at the at that bridge. That's where you'd park. Okay. And then you'd you'd park there and to the left, about a mile and a half. You'd have to walk down this little dirt road along this other ditch. Okay. And that that would be the tractor road, you know, where they get the tractors up in there and, you know, do the fields and the right, beans right. and stuff like that. So they already they already cut the beans. And I'm going walking down this ditch down there and I get to the edge of the thickets. And the edge of the thickets is high grass weeds, uh, thorn bushes and stuff like that. And as I walk, I'm, I'm looking at this, this grass, it's like almost like a grassy weeded bushes and stuff. Okay. And then you got, the, you got the trees in the woods. Okay. Right. Right. But you have to cross through that tall, tall grass to get to the, to the actual wood part of the thicket. Right. The woods part of the thicket. And I'm there. I'm, I'm like, well, okay, I'm after rabbit today. So I thought, well, I'll walk around to the side, other side of the thickets where I don't have to walk through all that high grass. But then I stopped and I thought, well, hey, I just kind of kick some of this grass around, see if I can jump a rabbit. So I stepped into that grass. And right there next to the to the woods where, it, you know, the trees and stuff were at, the tall grass, there was an explosion. This is the only way I can define it. This is an explosion. A deer, the size, oh my God, I, I, I don't, I think it was until at, until that time, that was the biggest deer I ever seen. He's probably 300 pounds. Oh, wow. Huge rat. He jumps up and he cuts to the right and runs out into the bean field, which has already been cut. There's nothing but stalks out there. Okay. And so he's running across the bean field and well, I didn't actually see him run. He he just ran that direction. And then at the same time, something the size of, if you ever seen Mighty Joe Young? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Some, something the size of that run through the, turned around and ran through the woods, the, the thickets. Where did it come out of? He was, it's like the deer was bedded up in that tall grass. Right. And he was right behind it. Oh. I guess the only thing I can assume was that he's fixing to kill my deer. Right. He was like stalking and, it. Yeah. It was like he was there waiting to jump him. And I just come up at the exact right time, kicked that grass, that deer jumped up. And was it shot to the right? That other one, like, I'm facing directly at it. It. It turns all I saw was the ass, excuse my language, that's okay, and the back of his head and the size of his shoulders. And if you ever seen the movie Mighty Joe Young, yes, that's about the size it was. And I'm like, oh my god, what in you know, that's I huge. actually fell backwards and landed on my butt. That's huge, it was so big and it had that conical head. And the oh. reason why I saw that conical head is because it's like at the very top of his head. Mm-hmm. His hair. It, you ever seen the little rascals in Alpha Alpha? Yes. It, it reminded me of that. Of course, at that time, I wasn't thinking that. It was only Kind of after. like a little mohawk. Well, it's just like a little little twisted strand of hair sticking up. Okay. Off the top of his head. Okay. And it was on, on a point. Oh, Okay. You know? And like I said, all that commotion, I fell backwards. I was on my butt. 
And I'm just sitting there looking. It was like, oh my God, what what just happened? So the deer ran, and then he right shot after, to the right, he shot to the right. Then right after that, something else at the came, same time. At the same at time, at the same time as it was shooting to the right, something else was running away from me. It's like I was directly facing its rear end in the back of its head. Wow! Did it ever turn around? No. And when he got in those woods, he was gone, disappeared. Did it create a lot of commotion going through those woods? I would say probably for a few seconds, probably 20 seconds is all I heard. Okay. Because I remember sitting there on my butt right as soon as, like I said, it shot me so bad I fell backwards. Yeah, I'm sure. Because what it was, I stepped in the tall grass, and as all this commotion happened, I went to step backwards and tripped and fell. Oh, wow. And as I'm sitting there on my butt, I'm kind of looking upwards, and I see that conical head, and I see the little bit of hair sticking up like an alfalfa, you know, on the little rascals. And uh, it took me after going back and thinking about it, mm-hmm. and seeing it in my mind, mm-hmm. that I saw that. I didn't see a face. All I saw was his butt and his back and how wide his shoulders were. And then I'm thinking, I sat there and thought about it. How did that thing run straight through those trees? Because it was a thicket. So there's trees so, so encumbered there. How did it run through there? How did it, you know, there might be trees where I have to turn sideways and step through them. But this thing, either it just ran them down, yeah. which I didn't see a path. Well, then I didn't go looking for a path either. I called it a day when that happened. Well, we've talked to, my brothers and I, we had a conversation a couple, it's been about a month. We talked about this, maybe two months. And I think a conversation like this came up because there was a couple of uh, guests that I was talking to that we spoke just the same conversation. And the only thing that we can figure is that, there is, it's a combination of the, their skin is so much more tougher than ours. Just, I don't want to say it's like rhino hide because I don't know, but I'm trying to give a, an analogy or a comparison to a really tough leathery hide. And you know what? A little bit of a deviation here, but we'll still stay on track. I promise. Is that, um, I knew this young lady, her and her sister Uh, They really had a heart from the homeless and they would go out and buy all these like uh, Chick-fil-A meals and pizza and all these uh, uh, really scrumptious foods. And they would go out to the homeless in the community of Tulsa and they would uh, go to certain places and they knew where certain people uh, actually set their tent or their little structure where they lived. And they would describe to me uh, the leathery appearance of their skin, just a very weathered yeah. leathery type of texture to the skin. And it's, it's weathered. They they're out in the, in the elements, cold, heat, wind, all that. And so I wonder with these Bigfoot, their, their hide is so tough and the oils that we we've talked about this numerous times. I think that there's an oil that's emitted in the hair much more than ours. We have the same thing on our skin. Um, the oils that come off in our hair and on our uh, surface of the skin, arms, things like that. But I wonder that oil in that hair is actually very protective too, where it allow you to glide through. You would think it would get tangled. That's our first impression. I believe it doesn't. I believe it acts yeah like a glide, like, like a, in the analogy of putting butter on and going through with the oils and the hair secrete, the, the oil secretion onto the hair, the tough hide, it can go through briars. Whereas we, we don't have that ability. We don't have the strength or the desire. (laughs) Um, so anyway, I didn't mean to deviate too much there, but, um, that's pretty incredible. It sounds like a squatch to me, a Sasquatch. Yes, I think that one was a Sasquatch. I think the one that that ran up on me with the deer was a Sasquatch. I mean, it could have been anything, really, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. That's true. We're just basing it on the conical head 
and you really didn't see, you didn't say you saw long ears or a snout or a tail. No. Um, you know, so, but could have been a something else? It's possible. It's possible. Well, I, possible, but not probable. I mean, that, that's it, true. It's something, it's something that that's, you know, it's basically something that you would take note of as being odd and strange. Mm-hmm. True. You know, and, and usually, you know, especially hunters, you know, there's not much in the woods that surprise them. And there's, there, you know, from the weather to, you know, just everything in your environment, you've witnessed it. You, you basically can adapt to it and just work with it, you know. Right. And when something odd and strange happens, it kind of puts a little hiccup in your in your train of thought, it it's almost like the most what really takes you out of your game is the lack of sound, the mm. lack of, of of what you're used to when you go in the woods. Right. You know, that's what takes you out of your game. Right. And a lot of people just ignore it. You know, a lot of hunters say, "Well, you know, I've been hunting for fifty years. I ain't never seen nothing." That's because you never stop to realize there's a difference. There's a difference in in this and that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just ignore it because, you know, they're like, well, I got a hunt that I'm going to go t- turn up some disc, disc up some rows here. So I'm going to get my hunt, hunt on and I'm going to get gone. So I ain't got time to pay attention to anything that's odd or strange. Well, you know, plus, yeah, you know, you're... if, if you... Go ahead. If you let it, let it sidetrack you, then you're liable to get yourself in some kind of trouble, you know? Well, it's kind of, it's the difference in being hunting versus attentive hunting and, and really yeah. being present in the moment. Um, that's just kind of my, you know, some, and I've been there before, you know, as a hunter, you don't get a lot of time sometimes to prep and scout like you would like. It's a rush to get out there and then you get out there, then you go, okay, I got to see something now. I'm, you know, I got to. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Come on out, dear. You know, so yep. it really, to me, takes a couple days to acclimate truly to the woods and to get yep. that to get that sense of being wood savvy again, listening to sounds. Yep. Um, and, you know, what I do is I just kind of memorize my, uh, if I'm looking at timber, can I see the edge of a hill? where it down slopes and I can kind of memorize that. Yeah. So I memorize it in the morning and the evening and you scan it enough times, dozens and dozens of times during a sit. Um, I don't stalk hunt. That's just the way I do it. So I have plenty of time to scan the woods and that's how I see things like, wait a minute, that wasn't there before. What's that silhouette? You know, yeah. and I'm scanning exactly. and then, then I just stop and I freeze and I'm just, my eyes are totally focused on that and see if it moves. And yep. I just keep looking. So that's kind of the way we should all, if you're investigating or stalking, you know, walking, you, you just don't want to walk. You want to go slowly and then stop, yep. listen, look slowly around, and you'll see a lot more, of course. Um, yeah. Well, that's like me. When I would go <clears throat> squirrel hunting, especially get up in the morning and go squirrel hunting, I'd ask myself, if I was a squirrel that ate nuts all day, what's the first thing I'd want in the morning? Right. Which would a drink of water. Of course. So what I would do is I'd go find a ditch, whether it could be a big ditch or, or small ditch in the middle of the woods. And then I would look for a tree, a dead tree that's down. And I would get on that dead tree and I would sit at one end and I would just sit there and scan and looking for squirrels. And I would usually, that method, I usually killed my limit every time I went. You know, and uh, I remember one time I'm sitting on this dead tree. I would go to one end of the tree and I might hunt it, just sit there and hunt it and kill five or six squirrel. And then I'd go to the other end of the tree and sit there, let everything settle down. And I'd kill five or six more squirrel. And I'd go to the other end, just go back and forth, scanning different tree tops. Okay. And I, I remember I was sitting on a tree one time and I was, the ditch was probably about, probably about 10 foot away from me. And it was, it was probably about an eight foot ditch, eight foot wide and looked like it might've been five or six foot deep. And there's water in it. And I remember sitting there 
and I'm hearing something coming on the other side of that ditch through those woods. And it's just making all kinds of ruckus and noise. And I'm like, oh, my God, this thing must be pretty confident and sure that he's not going to get, you know, that there's not a predator here that's going to bother him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. And I I remember as it's getting closer, and I'm thinking I'm it's fixing to reveal itself any time now. So I'm sitting there in my 12-gauge, and I'm looking. I've got a 12-gauge pointed probably about four foot off the ground, thinking I'm fixing to see something. Mm-hmm. And as it come out, got closer and closer and closer. I'm lowering the point of my, my 12 gauge down. Finally, it was, it was probably about a three pound squirrel and it was just making all kinds of ruckus, yeah. you know? And yeah. I'm I hate that myself, sometimes. I hate that sometimes you know? when a squirrel sounds like something on all fours. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's like out here where I live at right now, you know, I've got core land all the way down to the lake. And I hear stuff in those woods all the time. And between it, squirrels, they have they don't have a care in the world. But if there's something in those woods that's got those squirrels worried, they'll oh, get up yeah. in those trees and they'll bark. Oh yeah, they start. And they're gonna let you know when there's a predator around. Oh yeah, and they just continue and continue and continue. And you know that another thing is, there's times I've been out in deep woods and the birds tell me where the squirrels are at. I can see that. You know, I can see that. The, the birds will get get next to like a, a crow or something. Will get next to where the squirrel's at and just start crowing away, and get your attention. You look up there, and if you just keep watching, that crow will eventually fly away. And if you just keep watching, you'll see a squirrel. Hmm. You know, they'll tell on you. Yeah, but, interesting. Uh, let me think here. My my next Bigfoot or Sasquatch encounter. Okay, there is, okay, there's a time I was married, me and my wife. This was probably about 2013 here. And 2000, between 2010 and 2013, we would go back up and go fishing back up in the bottoms. We, we, we call it uh, Big Lake Bottoms. There's a road that runs off. It's a gravel road that goes all the way around it, and it's about a 300-acre lake. And in there at the southwest corner, there's a road we call Seven Mile Road because mm -hmm. you can get back up seven miles back up in the bottoms and then it dead ends and they got the road blocked off. And me and my wife, we, we would go about halfway through there, about three and a half miles, and the road would curve. It'd be gravel all the way through there and then it would curve. And in that curve, there'd be like a land bridge, probably about about 20 foot wide and on one side of it's one ditch and on the other side of the other ditch. So we would just use that. We could fish in either ditch. Okay. Just by turn, turn around, throw it out that way, turn around, throw out the other way, you know? Right. Well, we're back up in there and I've got, <clears throat> I've got two or three poles and she's got two poles and we've got our lawn chairs, a cooler, tackle boxes, a little bit of snacks, you know, and may, uh, May even have radio going. I don't, if we did, it wasn't very loud because I don't like loud music in the woods. I, you know, but mm -hmm. just relaxing, trying to enjoy a Sunday. You know. Sure. So we're sitting there, and the fish are biting. We're catching a little bit of catfish. I think I caught a five-pound cat and a couple of little blue cats, and she caught a couple of uh, pretty good-sized little brim or bluegill. And all of a sudden, about five foot in the water. From the bank, we're hearing boom, plum, 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 and it's like from starts like from right in front of her, and I'm fishing about ten foot down from her. Okay. And it's right in front of me too. What, is and it I'm rocks being there. thrown? Is it is that a sound well, of rocks being thrown? Well, this this is what happened. Is I thought it was a jumping carp. Hmm. That's what I, I figured that's what it was. You couldn't see them, but you you hear bloom, bloom, just something, something hitting the water. Okay. So I'm thinking it's a jumping carp, but I, my wife's sitting down there and she's kind of, you know, she's not, she's a country girl, but she's not. And I look at her and I'm like, you see all this? Yeah, I see it. I said, you know what that is? And she said, I'm thinking in my mind it's jumping carp, but mm -hmm. I'm going to mess with her. Yeah. Something's throwing rocks at us. Now I'm thinking I'm gonna, you know, get her, get her going. Right. 
I'm thinking it's actually jumping carp, but I didn't see no fish jumping. And so as it, it keeps doing it, then it stops for about two or three minutes, and then all of a sudden it's like bloom, 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 right? Just like someone's shooting at, at us right in front of us and hitting about five foot off the bank. You know, and I mean, mm. it's rapid fire it's a concession. Right. And as I'm messing with her, telling her Bigfoot's throwing stuff at us, the two-minute pause, and then it starts up again, and then a rock actually hits the bank in front of me, hits my tackle box, and hits my foot. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, hell, that is somebody throwing rocks at us. Well, as I was turning to my left to tell my wife, pack it up, let's get out of here. Some Something is throwing rocks at us. Right. I turned my left to face her. She's got everything. Her fishing poles didn't take the bait off, the hooks. Just, she's just got everything wadded up underneath her arms, and she's sprinting to the truck. Wow. I'm like, I better get my stuff and get ready because she's going to leave me here by myself. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. You know? But I thought I was going to mess with her and just kind of aggravate her, you know? Right. And come to find out, a rock did hit hit my, hit my the bank rolled up and hit my tackle box and it was probably probably just a little bit bigger than a baseball hmm so, that's big you know that's, that's huge. pretty big yeah it's dangerously i mean yeah that's dangerous. I mean, they, they were just plopping in front of us right but i thought i i thought it was a little funny because as i'm trying to mess with her and kind of give her the eebie-jeebies you know, and then when I realized that something is doing rocks at us, she's already, she's she's twenty foot up to you know up the bank there, almost to the truck, low, mm -hmm. about ready to throw everything in the back of the truck and take off, and I better catch up. <laughs> yeah. You, know? you initially so, didn't know what it was though. You were just trying to make light of it or something. Yeah, I was just I was I thought, really thought that it was probably just jumping carp, but as I sat there hindsight usually carp don't jump like that unless something spooks them mm. you know mm -hmm. right up next to the bank there wasn't no boats nothing spooking them right you know and like i said then the rock hit my hit my tackle box on my foot and i was like oh hell it is rocks something is over there throwing rocks at us mm-hmm wow so then I turn and look at her, and she done left me in the dust, you know? So, as well, a matter of fact, I just, she's my ex-wife now. We've been divorced for about eight years now, six to eight years. And, you know, matter of fact, we do stay in contact, and we were just talking about that last month. And she was talking about, yeah, you mm -hmm. know, you thought I was going to sit there and just uh, laugh it off? <laughs> no. So yeah. Either you was going to be, either you're going to get, get behind me and be gone or I was going to leave you there. Yeah. Well, you know? when people are afraid, you know, you're just trying to, you know, have self-preservation, you know, um, move it or lose it. Let's go. You yep. know? So especially when something like that in your out really in remote areas, what would be throwing something at you? All you can say is that something has an opposing thumb because deer, they yep. don't throw rock. Bears don't throw rock. You know, any, waterfowl they don't throw rocks you know it has to be something with an opposing thumb to grasp and throw so exactly it can be a man or swatch dog man or any other type of cryptid or whatever something to that nature yeah exactly it's something with something that's that's wanting to get your attention in one way or another yes you know Yes. They're one to make their presence known. Yes. You're too close. I'm going to let you know you're too close or just to pester. Who knows? Who knows? Yep. We can just kind now, of speculate. Yep. Now, there was a time, and this is what I'm talking about. You know, people say that they're marked or feel like they're marked, that mm -hmm. they have these experiences. Mm hmm. You know, they're, I lived over Mississippi County and we were probably probably 11 to 15 miles as a crow flies 
from Mallard and Big Lake and the bottoms in the woods. Okay. Well, me and my, I, I was uptown with my son-in-law and we came back and the road I lived on was like a horseshoe road. It was a big horseshoe. Okay. You get down the road and it, it curves around and it comes back and you the street behind you is actually, I think it was the, the west side and I was on the east side, but it curves around. And right there, I mean, we're within two miles of what used to be Air Force Base, home of the B-52s. Mm -hmm. But they have since, you know, they have shut that down and just let it dilapidate. I mean, it's just absolutely terrible. They're, they've rented out some of the, the housing units, but for the most part, there's like a, a lot of decay and a lot of mm. falling down. Okay. But anyways, we turn down my street and we're going we're pointed north and we're pulling and i live about a quarter down the street and then on the left well as we're coming down the street i look up above the houses at the very end where it curves around and i'm looking up and i'm seeing at first it looked like a huge cigar shape looking thing up in the air and it's silent there's no noise there's no vibration there's nothing it's silent okay and as i get closer to it and pull in my driveway i realize all i'm seeing is basically the side profile as it's moving to the west and as it's passing up the neighborhood and it's not i wouldn't say right over the neighborhood but it's kind of like on the outer edge of it right you know Mm -hmm. And behind the houses on that U shape, it's just, you know, farm fields. Right, right. And, and as I'm sitting there, it's black, and you see the different indentations around it, you know, on, on it, the sides of it and stuff. Not really sides, but because it's actually round. Okay. And it's like a, it's like a round UFO, and it looked like it was probably, at least, at least the size of a four to six football field that's how huge it was oh gosh and and me and my son i was looking at it and we're trying to determine what is that because it's so quiet there's no kind there's and it's getting nobody's attention it was a cloudy overcast day and it was pretty close to you know turning the evening but not dark mm -hmm. you know and as we're sitting there looking at it, it's just, it's quiet. It's, we thought it might have been a blow up something or another, you know? Mm -hmm. But as we looked at it, we realized it's it's being controlled. And then as we pull in the driveway, we realized we're only seeing kind of like a side profile. Mm -hmm. And then I think I went out to the middle of my street and went to the very right side of the street and looked as it was going west. I walked to the east and looked, and it was huge. It was big and round. Wow. Nobody even recognized it, said anything. Even my son-in-law kind of looked at it like, oh, well. And it, th that's, that's the reason why, you know, you could tell people what's going on, and nobody acknowledges it because it's kind of like it's it's something that they, they see it, it registers, and it's like, Oh, well, how, it's kind of like they do this instant. How does it affect me now? What does this do and affect my life at all at this moment in time? Yeah. And if it's not something that, that affects them, it's kind of like in one ear and out the other. It's just like it's there. They store it in their memory or just don't even remember it. They just let it go. Well, sometimes, then, it, it, well, it's kind of like people seeing something, but they're not seeing something. It's kind of like people, and I know this is, personally happened to me back when I was going to school uh, years ago I had 20 miles to drive and I remember this vividly I would get to school and I would be like I don't remember driving it was so yeah. it was so automatic pilot so to speak yep. with me driving through traffic changing lanes and it was quite busy in downtown Minneapolis I had to go through every day twice a day but I remember vividly many times I'm just like was traffic busy? You know, I'm just trying to self-assessment, yeah. and, and I was just on automatic pilot. So I'm sure in many ways people 
they're just going about their way and you know they're so busy in their mind yes. thinking steps ahead days ahead hours ahead that you can be looking at something but not really processing what you're looking at exactly and that's scary when you do that when you get up mm-hmm. and you go to work and, and you get there and you don't even realize you know you go the same way every day but you don't <laughs> realize the event you can't remember anything in particular between home and work. Oh yeah. It's scary because it is, you know, and, uh, that's, that's what I was talking about being marked. And I don't think it's really being marked. I think once, once you start opening and I don't want to say opening your mind up because it almost sounds like, you know, you become delusional, but it's kind of like when you start registering these things and, and you really spend time processing them and thinking about them. It's like it happens more and more. Well, and I've had this conversation many times with, with other people as well as Wiley Dave and my brothers and, and many guests. And sometimes I'll notice in the comments, people will say, come on, Lance, this guy, he's had three Bigfoot, three Sasquatch, two dog men, UFOs, come on what get no nobody can have that well first of all why why couldn't someone have that i mean i wasn't there who am i as dave would say who am i to call this person a liar i wasn't there the other thing is i really do believe and it's conceivable based on if you get into the uh I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but if you get into a lot of this um, law of attraction, right? If you get into this quantum energy, and we talked about this on another show this past week, I did, about how like attracts like. And so I'll just use the example, Wiley Dave and my brother Lane. When I'm with them, we see something. Almost every time, someone's going to see something and and I don't know what it is when I have... Either of those guys or both. I'm I'm on high alert because I usually see something. Uh, Wiley Dave, he's seen many things. He saw the Dogman creature, but he's also had two instances. And we're going to get into, we're going to do some shows regarding this. He's had two close encounters with UFO aircraft. One very, very close. I mean, close. Like if he was... In front of his truck, he could almost reach out and touch the UFO craft yeah. that close. So I do believe there's some level of affinity, of attraction. When people start seeing things, it it comes more frequent to these people. Now, does it help to be in an area where there is a high traffic of these creatures or UFOs? Sure, of course. That's very likely, very probable. Um, versus someone that just lives in the city and never goes out in the woods, never really is in an area where there's sightings of UFOs. But so there are areas I would say that are more magnetic, if you will, or a higher attraction of various things. Uh, and if you live in those areas, then the likelihood of you seeing something or experiencing something becomes more likely. Um, but I will get But yeah, I think person to person, I think there is this attraction and I don't understand it all. I'll just say that I do believe that or conceive that, that there is an affinity for people having more of an attraction of experiencing, whether it be UFOs, uh, or whether it be creatures. Uh, yeah, I, can I explain it all? No. Does it happen? Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I remember reading about the Hindus and talking about the third eye, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know that that gland in your in your mm-hmm. head that is like enlightenment. Yes, and I I compare it to something like that because once once you do experience, I know I know at a young age I I saw what I I consider to be the first time I seen anything like a UFO. Hmm. And it seems like every every so often, you know, different things I'll see or have run-ins with Bigfoot or dog manners. It just seems like it's something different all the time. Right. And it's almost like something in your mind, like a like a combination lock, is 
is has been solved in your mind and you're actually you're experiencing things and witnessing things that other people are more or less subconsciously just ignoring and so you're you're letting these things get your attention at least mentally it's where you take note of it yeah you know and and then it's like where people might be there to experience it with you too but that's just like okay i went fishing with a buddy of mine mississippi river was right you know not very far from us and we, mm -hmm. what we would do is i would get old mountain dew two liter bottles and i'd go to the dollar store and get those light sticks you know you snap them and and they glow oh yeah well, you yeah take, you, you, you take them and put them in the mountain dew bottles it has that that kind of greenish mm -hmm. tint to them mm -hmm. and you put them out there you know you jug with them and ain't nothing like you know if, you, if you've never done it you sit you're sitting there watching you know you put you put your jugs out there and all of a sudden you know one of those the, that they're glowing mm -hmm. about, almost like a fluorescent green and all of a sudden you see it just swimming across the ditch there mm -hmm. you know yeah you know, or the back i never did do that but that sounds great <laughs> So we're sitting there, and what we did is we took the boat, and we, we put probably about 20, 25 jugs out. And then we went back to the bank, and we pole fished, waiting on those jugs to start moving. Mm. And we had binoculars to watch the jugs. Okay. You know? And so I, we're sitting on the, the west side of the, of the Mississippi there, looking east towards Memphis. You know, mm -hmm. Tennessee and Memphis. Mm -hmm. And I I thought, well, I'll just take the binoculars and just look around. What I did, I took the binoculars and, and I saw, and the only thing that I can compare it to is uh, Linda Moulton Howe back years ago had some type of show, and she showed pictures of what looked like grown spacecraft, but you couldn't see them with the naked eye. You had to have, they were like almost camouflaged or or hmm. you know it's like you couldn't see i forgot what, what they said they used to see them maybe but infrared maybe infrared something like that mm -hmm. but it, it looks something like one of those drones but it was huge you know like oh a, yeah like a spaceship and of course my buddy there his name was bill and i'm like bill check this out and he looked at it he says oh man that ain't nothing that's just that that's a space station and I thought to myself, that's a space station. I guess it could be. I mean, it, it, it looked like it could have been the size of it, but that's what people do. Hmm. They see something that doesn't look right. They come up with an explanation for it and never give it another second thought. No, because our mind, the way our minds are designed, we're looking for solutions. We're looking for end results. You know, yeah. kind of a, it's kind of a self debriefing. And we can only make these conclusions based on our reference, based on our life experiences. Yeah. And life experiences, no one has told us about these UFOs existing, which they do, which means that are they manned? Some, I would say yes. Some, possibly unmanned? I would say yes. So really no one's experienced that. And our government has designed this uh, narrative over the years, decades, and they've perfected it very well, that they have used uh, Hollywood and Disney and so many other uh, media outlets to make us look like a fool if we have a sighting or have a belief that you're just, you're fruity, that yeah, you're, exactly. you're one of those people, you're a conspiracy fruity person, that if you believe in that, we're going to poke fun at it, we're going to make movies, a Bigfoot that's just smiley happy they don't really exist it's just a nice campfire story or whatever and so yep. there's a lot of um and this is our government has worked very closely with these outlets to do that and to poke fun at people if you have a belief and it's really kind of a gaslighting type of narrative where yep that way you know uh and and people you know i'll be and so the ridicule is real when people go i don't want to tell anybody i'll be ridiculed because that's the way it's been designed over the years because nobody exactly. wants to be ridiculed or embarrassed, but you know, it's, it's just one of those things where you know what you saw, you know what you heard, and it was totally different than anything you've ever heard. But it's the experience too, that goes with, like you said earlier, it was just quiet. Something was yeah. up 
or like I've never seen a plane do that before. That's that's not a plane. I don't even hear any engine. That's weird. Exactly. You know, and so that's kind of what Wiley Dave was saying. That he goes, and the thing with Wiley Dave is that he's extremely experienced at aircraft, at mechanics. He's worked on them his whole life. He's worked on helicopters and jets. He can tell you by the sound of something. He'd look up in the sky and he can tell you what it is. He can say, yeah, yep. that's this kind of jet. Uh, that's that kind of helicopter. Listen to the sound. You know, well, to me, a helicopter's a helicopter. Um, but he can tell you. So when he saw this UFO aircraft, he said, it's nothing like I've ever seen. It's yep. the, the propulsion system is nothing like we have. It's, it's anti-gravity. So, but anyway, when you come across something like that, you just know what it's not. Exactly. That's, that's the same thing as Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's one of the big things that, that really aggravate me. You've got all these people that call themselves researchers, and for the most part, I would imagine, I'm not I'm not downing or, you know, disrespecting any of them. Yeah. You know, but they're doing the same thing. They're, it's like, okay, David Politis, how many samples of DNA did, did him and what, Meba catch him? Catch him? you know, analyze and substantiate that there's DNA evidence. There's footprints. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the, the one thing that really aggravates me the most is you'll have people that get out that's been doing it for years mm -hmm. and they're doing the same thing. They're, they're, you know, it's kind of like they're stuck in this vicious circle of, Okay, I got to prove to the world that they're real. I've got to prove that they're real. That's already been done. Yeah, We're in many in ways it right has. It, it has, it's, and I truly believe that our government has more than proven that. Now, they're not going to come out and tell us, Joe Q Citizen, um, they're going to keep it quiet for many reasons, I believe, which I've gotten into over the years. But I, I do believe that it has been proven to them, and that's why they keep it quiet. Um, for us as researchers, I think the proof with all these shows that we do, it's not so much do they exist. They do. It is trying to what, you know, what I'm trying to do. And I try to self analyze every time I do a show is why do I do this? I want to keep those that are out in the woods. Number one, safe, safe. Yes. Um, to go back to their families. Um, Number two, I want them to have fun, but how do you have fun is that you operate with a set of rules. Exactly. Uh, you operate with a set of principles and rules and safety measures and contingency plans. That's how it's fun. And you don't, you don't deviate from that. And whether it's two people or four people, or I don't much care for it, although I've been by myself many times is, is, you know, solo, but the contingency plans and operation are different solo versus when you're with two, three, four, or six people. Um, so it's one of those things where I think to have fun, to enjoy yourself and to be safe and get back home, you need to really think things through. Now, unfortunately, the David Politis, you know, you brought, you brought that up. I've read his books that are extremely fascinating. The thing that's really remarkable about some of David Pilates books is that um, some, not all, most are kids and some are seniors uh, that have come up missing. Now, there are a majority of kids that are found alive. Yes. Many miles away under very rugged terrain. So it kind of makes you scratch your head like, how did that even go? How was that even possible? So the thing of it is, though, you do come across some stories of very savvy, avid uh, hunters that are very familiar with an area. I would call them survivalist. They know how to live out in the woods, be gone all night, but yet they just disappear and they have yep. families and, you know, what happens? Um so you, I think about that sometimes. So even the most savvy hunter, most experienced person in the woods can still have a problem if you're caught, well, if you're caught unattentive 
you know, just kind well, of enjoying the woods, but you got to be on, you got to be on alert and who knows? All it takes, all it takes is one mistake. It does. And just, uh, you one know, one mistake. Yeah. I, I mean, so you, know. you can have contingency plans, but unfortunately it may not come out. The outcomes may be different than what you wanted. And so yeah. you well, can't predict those things, but they do happen. And I'm not telling people to be paranoid, of course, but be aware of certain areas of a high level of missing persons. I guess that's more, it can yeah. happen anywhere, but be more alert. Exactly. But, you know, what, what really aggravates me and bothers me about a lot of these researchers is they'll, they'll tell you, well, I've got information that I'm not going to share. I've got pictures. I've got proof I'm not going to share. You know, I'm going to keep that close to the vest. Like, they're waiting for the opportunity to come out and say, I'm, there it is, I proved it. There it is, I proved it to everybody. Here's the problem with proving that these these things exist. Okay, to somebody who has a honest mind, who will give an honest assessment, you don't have to prove it. There's enough proof there. It's already The proof has already exists. The probability of the existence of these, if you've never run across them, there's more evidence and proof of the existence of Bigfoot and Dogman than there is evidence and proof of the theory of evolution. And society has accepted evolution as the gospel. And myself, my perspective and what I teach my kids is man cannot evolve. We are incapable of evolving. If you break it down to the bottom line, mm -hmm. evolution, why does an animal being creature evolve? Evolution is about adapting to your environment or you will perish. So these creatures that live in nature, when their climate changes and the circumstances of their existing changes, they have to change with it or they will go extinct. Man cannot change with his environment because he creates his own environment. He creates dwellings. If he's cold, he turns the heat on. If he's hot, he turns the, co the air conditioner on. Mm -hmm. He cooks his food. He cannot evolve, at least not in a physical form. Intelligence is not evolution. Learning is not evolution. Evolution, the, what I was taught about evolution is the bottom line is you either – an animal has to evolve to suit its environment or it goes extinct. That is the forces, the external forces that causes evolution. To think that a man was an ape-like creature that lived in a tree in the jungle and that one day he decided he was going to jump out of that tree and live on the ground with all the predators – in a less safer environment and more stirsome and struggling environment because he's leaving what has gotten him through mm -hmm. all the millennium. And all of a sudden, he, there's nothing that's going to force an ape-like creature to evolve into a man. It's not like the big cities and, and the civilization was already there for them to say, hmm, I'm going to leave the country and go live in the city. Mm-hmm. That can't happen. That there was no cities. There was nothing causing that ape-like creatures to jump out of that tree, straighten up, and walk like a man. Right. And that, and like I said, there's more. Ev there's more evidence of the existence of Bigfoot and Dogman, even of UFOs, than there is evidence that oh. evolution yeah, actually I, applies. I, I would. You know, uh, now, I would fully agree on that. Um, and even though that people would say, and another thing is I don't much care for the word uh, cryptid. The prefix comes from cryptozoology or cryptozoologist, exactly, yes. which is a more or less a, the definition being a myth of something, some living being or creature that exists that is not able to be measured against the scientific method. Um, or science based, but really that's a very poor word to describe these beings because you're assuming, 
you you put it in a category of first of all mythologic or you put it in a category like a deer or an elk or a bear these are really oranges and apples so to speak in the sense that you're dealing you're dealing with a being that is highly adaptive highly intelligent supernatural speed strength and size and it's it's one of those things where you can can you have something exist that not a lot of eyes have been laid upon it? Yes, of course. We're always finding rare animals in jungles, uh, rare fish that uh, are in the oceans or in these deep uh, gorges. Uh, so why couldn't Bigfoot or Sasquatch or some type of a being exist that we've never been... Um, it's, it's not prevalent. There's not many of them. There's a lot of them, but compared to humans, there's not. So the probability is there. We don't know everything. We've not been over every piece of land. Um, there's still many places that are unexplored. So I'm kind of with, I'm definitely with you on that. Um, there's just a lot we, we know we've known, but you know, it's one thing you just got to experience it. You got to go out into the woods. You got to spend some time and some people have more experiences than others for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, again, uh, my brother Lane, Wiley, Dave, uh, and we've experienced quite a bit ourselves just going out in remote deer camps and experiencing, I mean, versus just, uh, uh small groups or very, uh, very small groups, two, three guys versus if you go with a group of 30, you know, so, um, yeah. we're about getting close here to the end of my battery life here. So, yeah. um, well, I've, I've still got a couple more and I've even got a, uh, well, recording that I was wanting to run by you. Well, I tell you what, that's, that's perfect. Why don't we do this? Why don't we, uh, have you back on and we'll do a part two. Okay, that's fine. How's that? But l let me tell you about one instance, though. You know where Cherokee Nation is at o in Oklahoma there? Yes. You know, up there by Springdale? Yes. Uh, West Solomon Springs there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm very familiar well, with that. Okay, there's, there's a place called Cherokee Casino there. Yep, I know exactly where it's my, at. My father, when he was still alive... Uh, him and my mother loved to go there. Okay. And so I would get basically initiated to drive them there. <laughs> and, you know, we would take 412 across the state to get there. Mm hmm. And, uh, well, I can't even remember the name. We were coming back. We, we used to go and, of course, we would get, you know, play, gamble and play there for four or five hours and then drive home. And I, you know, I ended up driving home. We ended up driving home, you know, wee hours of the morning. Right. And we're between two, two o'clock in the morning and daylight. Okay. Well, my mother's in the back seat. My father's in the front seat. He's sleeping, snoozing, snoring pretty good and everything. And we're coming into, uh, I, I, I can't remember the name of the town, but, uh, we're on the outside of the town. We're probably about five miles from coming into it. Okay. And I'm noticing it's where, the, you know, when you go uphill, it opens up the two lanes, a passing lane. And yeah, a, yeah. Traffic lane. Okay, we're, we're coming uphill, and I'm driving, and it's probably, God, 3.30 in the morning. And my dad just kind of, I guess he woke himself up snoring. He raises up and he's looking around and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. My mom's kind of laid in, you know, in the corner of the back seat, just looking out the window. And as we're coming up, the lanes open up to, you know, two lane there. And I'm thinking down the road, I'm seeing a, a carpet that somebody, you know, about a 12 foot carpet that somebody must have lost. Or either they just threw it off the back of their vehicle and just went on. Okay. And it's laying in conjunction with the actual, like the, the, the white line or the yellow line on the side of the road. Okay. It's laying in conjunction with that, which is like crossing that line. 
just the very end of it's crossing that line. I'm, and it's stuff like that. I used to be a CDO truck driver, so everything oh. stuff like that gets just gets my attention. Sure. You know, because it's it's a road hazard. Right. And I'm thinking it's just rolled up carpet. And at the end of it, it looks like it's kinked up, you know, like almost like an L at the end of it. Mm. And that was the side towards the field or the, you know, not the road side, but the other side. Right, right. So as we're getting closer to it, I'm kind of looking at it as it's, it's becoming clearer. You know, all I'm seeing is like with my headlights and my uh fog lights there are getting on it and as we get as we get to it i'm kind of like i'm wondering what it is so i'm slowing down and my dad's like you know kind of half dazed and asleep but he's like what are you slowing down for what's going on mm-hmm. and as he's raising up my mother's in the back seat and she's on the passenger side of the of the back seat and so she's right next to the window where she could see it of course the windows were tinted in the back you know it was right. a ford pickup with the tinted back windows but as we got up to it, I realized it wasn't. I slowed down. It was 55 mile an hour speed limit. I slowed down to maybe 30. And as I slowed down, what I thought was the carpet rolled up was actually something sitting on its butt with its legs stretched out, like in a V. And it's sitting there, and its head is down, like looking down between its legs. And it's steadily taking its arms, and it's just digging. And, and I realize it's eating something. It looks like it's eating roadkill. Wow. And as we got, got up next to it, my dad's like, what in the hell is that? My mom's like, oh, shit, speed up. Get out of here. Get out of here. And what I gathered from it now, it was just, you know, wasn't very long looking at it. Because like I said, it always slowed down to about 30 mile an hour. Right. And as, as we're sitting there going past it, it's got long, stringy hair, like down past its shoulders. And it's bent over, and it it's eating something. And as we got almost right next to it, it looked up, and all that it had was like black, silhouetted eyes. And it just, just kind of looked up and saw us going by there and it didn't flinch it just sat there and i noticed too where i was thinking that was like a a carpet rolled up yeah it its feet was so big it looked it's one leg there looked like a carpet you know it it looked like the the, a, a regular you know room carpet rolled up that's how big its leg was. Wow. And its, its leg was stretched out. My dad was like, what in the hell is that? Yeah. And my mom's like, speed up, you know, let's get out of here. And looking at it, and I, I got the best glimpse of it because my fog lights kind of shoot out to the sides. Yeah. To give you a, a wider perspective. I just saw it for an instance there. The only thing that I could compare it to to give you any kind of real description because of skin. Right. You know, you was talking about the skin looking leathery and, mm-hmm. and kind of uh, the only th- there's there's an old movie that come out as a kid. I was fascinated with it. It was called The Time Machine. Mm-hmm. And I think it was made in the 50s or 60s. Possibly. And the creatures that were, what they were is they were people that ended up going underground to survive. Mm. And they ended up staying there for decades. And mm-hmm. they adapted, evolved, as the movie would portray right. it. Right, right, To these hideous humanoid-looking creatures with the leathery skin and all that's the only thing that I've seen in my life that compared to, to that. Hmm. And it was weird because its arms looked they weren't real big, but they were muscular looking, you know, real cut. And I couldn't tell if it was wearing anything or not, but I know it had like long stringy hair from its head and then like stringy hair all over its body is what it looked like. It sounds something like, uh, <clears throat> there's a friend of mine, uh, 
I'm just going to go in his property until I hurt my back a few weeks back. Um, and he, it's in Oklahoma and he went, uh, he's got some property his mother has and him and a, a researcher came out from a well-known organization. This is an older gentleman and they went down on this river bottom. And now this property is very rarely trafficked by any humans. Uh, it's been in the family for a long time, I suspect. But he went down there at night because that's when things move around them most is at night. And he had something they heard jump out of a tree and land on this bank of this creek. And they shine their light down there and they first saw it squatted down. Its back was to them. And he said it had stringy hair coming from the head. It looked like Cousin It from the Monsters. Yeah. And it was just stringy, oily looking hair. And it stood up and turned around and looked at him. It had hair on its body, but nothing like coming out of the head. It was just drooped in front. And this thing jumped from the ground up about six feet onto the bank and ran and just started. It was running. And then it went to all fours and was just going on all fours yeah. and going in. And it freaked the researcher that was with him out. He just took out running. And he had already told him, if you see, if we see something, don't run away from me. Stay with me. Of course, that didn't work. Yeah. And uh, but, you know, so all right. uh, we'll get off here and then we'll keep in contact and we'll do a part two here this coming week. All right. Well, if I've run across anything else, I'll. Yes, take please let me know. <laughs> Absolutely, let me know, and then uh, I'll have uh, I'll do a little bit of a follow up right now. So you have a good night, and we'll stay in contact. Okay, you too. All right, brother. Talk soon. You take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, everybody. I had just a little bit of battery life left. I just saw it here, so didn't mean to cut him off there. But uh, we're going to do a, obviously a part two. We'll do a follow up. Very, very fascinating. Um, and it really, the overall arching, I don't want to say theme, but overall arching aspect to the sightings he's had, the experiences, is that, again, you could say, how can how can this person have this many encounters? I think it's it has a lot to do with what I was getting at earlier. I think some people have this ability of attraction uh, where they live. Um, and, and I know it sounds like it's out there, but I, I don't think so. Um, it just depends on a couple factors and I can't put my finger on it, but I know what happens to a lot of people. Again, Wiley Dave and my brother Lane, if you're ever with them, where you're going to see something almost every time, every time. If you have some comments on what you heard tonight, let me know. Um, I'm curious to know what he saw at the very end. I'm going to follow. So next time we talk, I'm going to get back into what he saw on that trip when he had his mom and dad and get into that, because that reminds me of some other encounter stories that are kind of somewhat, uh, similar, uh, in, in appearance, aside from the one that I t spoke of just now regarding the researcher and this buddy of mine on his mom's place. In the meantime, guys, I want you to be safe out there. I want you to take note of all of these shows. And if you yourself have had an experience, whether it be UFO related, ghost related, or cryptid related, please give me a call. I do want to hear. I am documenting this. Call us at the toll-free number 1-866-306-8085. Until then, this is Lance with Monster 911. Take care.